Good evening, everyone. My name is Ellie Arison, Agricultural Advisor with the Local Land Services Drought Adoption Officer Program, and will be your host for tonight's webinar. Welcome to tonight's event, and thank you for taking the time to join us for this very timely session discussing grain market trends and risk management with Nick Crundle from Market Check. Before we start tonight, I'd like to acknowledge that we are all dialing in from what always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I pay my respects to the Kamilaroi people who are the traditional custodians of the land and waters on which I'm standing on today and extend that to the traditional custodians you're all representing today, as well as elders past, present and emerging. This webinar is brought to you by the Drought Adoption Officer Program. The Drought Adoption Officer Program received funding from the Australian Government's Future Drought Fund through the Southern New South Wales Innovation Hub and the Southern Queensland Northern New South Wales Hub. Throughout the webinar tonight, if you have any questions, please place them into the QA box located on the control panel at the top of your screen. These questions will be manually reviewed, so please allow time for your questions to be published and we will address them at the end of the session. If we happen to run out of time, we'll endeavour to have your questions answered after the session. Now, I would like to introduce our, our presenter tonight, Nick Crundle. Nick Crundle is the CEO of MarketCheck. With over eight years at the company and more than a decade of industry experience, he has a background in trading and risk management, primarily serving Australian grain growers. He holds a Bachelor of Agriculture Economics from Sydney University and has previous experience with Ag Farm and Meat and Livestock Australia. Thank you, Nick, for your time tonight. Sally? I might kick off uh, then. Thanks a lot for having me, uh, everyone. Um, I'll try and keep this uh, nice and entertaining for about an hour. Um, as Ellie mentioned, if you do have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the Q&A box. Uh, otherwise, I'm more than happy to answer anything via email um, after tonight. Um, the agenda for me uh, tonight will be a little introduction uh, to market check. Then we'll get into uh, the risk management approach that we uh, talk a lot about at Market Check, and how and uh, it's a lot about how we educate our our clients on on approaching um, grain marketing. And then we'll get into the kind of meat and potatoes, which will be a market overview and some strategy considerations across canola, uh, barley, and wheat. I haven't included any pulses. I appreciate there'll be pulse growers uh, on the webinar tonight. Um, very happy to attack any um, pulse questions via email um, after the session. But yeah, just due to time rest uh, constraints, uh, we thought it'd be um, probably best to leave pulses out. But yeah, we will finish with a Q&A session depending on how much time we have at the end of the evening. Uh, a quick disclaimer is uh, market check or ag risk management has um, an AFSL, uh, an Australian Financial Services Licence. Everything that I talk about today um, is general in nature. Um, it doesn't take into consideration your own uh, circumstances. If you would like more personal advice, uh, then um, please get in touch and we can provide that. But uh, for this evening, uh, please take everything that I say um, as general. So just a quick um, introduction to who Market Check is. Uh, basically, we're a membership-based organisation, so it's an annual subscription. Uh, we've been running uh, for 30 years, so, so this year marked our 30th anniversary. Uh, it was started back in 1994, purely around educating uh, Australian grain growers uh, about grain markets. Um, so from there, we've progressed into also uh, providing year-round grain marketing strategies as part of that membership. Uh, we also execute grain into the markets as well, so via our grain agency um, product, which is essentially um, representing growers in the cash markets when they're selling their grain uh, in the domestic market. And we also run uh, managed programs as well. So uh, we are the largest advisory firm in the country when it comes to grain marketing. Um, and we offer basically a one-stop shop for all 
of our clients who are looking for intel, execution, education, and all that sort of stuff. If uh, you would like to get in touch with us around what we um, provide as a business, please use the QR code uh, that you can see there um, and just jot a few of your details down and uh, someone uh, from our business will give you a call. Uh, basically, what we're trying to achieve um, today is, is just to change a little bit around our approach to grain markets. And that's more about changing uh, our mentality on how to, how to manage our risk as grain growers. So we want to take some of the stress out of selling your grain. I, I appreciate uh, having dealt with clients for over a decade um, that grain marketing can often be seen as quite a stressful part of the job. Um, and, and it's really our role to try and take that stress away from your business. And tonight, I'll hopefully give you a few tools that you might be able to implement uh, into your business that will make the whole process just a little uh, less stressful for you, especially coming into uh, harvest um, like we are at the moment. Uh, we'll also go through uh, what's happening in market. So hopefully that'll give you a pretty clear view uh, on what is happening in global and domestic markets, a few of the geopolitical issues that we've got flaring up at the moment, um, and basically provide um, everyone with some actionable strategy uh, insights for this harvest. So uh, I won't go through particular uh, strategy recommendations, but I will provide um, uh, strategy considerations and things you might want to consider uh, going into uh, this harvest. So to kick off, uh, we'll talk a little bit about risk management approach. Essentially, this is how we think about our grain marketing or what we're trying to achieve um, out of grain marketing as Broadacre uh, you know, cropping businesses. The first thing is we do not uh, trade or speculate on a view of where grain prices might go. Our main focus should be to manage our risk so the first thing I wanted to get across to everyone tonight is uh, there is no way for certain to know where prices are going. There's always a risk that they could fall. And as growers, our number one risk is we're a producer, is that prices fall. And that is obviously detrimental to our bottom line um, in our businesses. So we want to get away from basically trying to pick the highs or, or say, oh, I think the price is going to kick higher here or, or whatever it may be, and think about things in terms of how much risk you have uh, in your business should prices fall from here. So once you uh, basically think about risk rather than just speculating on where you think prices uh, will go, it's important to manage our risk. One thing is that there's a misconception in the industry that derivatives are risky. Um, so we really want to basically upskill on the use of derivatives because over um, 10 to 15 years or even since um, 2008 when derivatives uh, got a bad name in grain markets, uh, they've been a, a, a very rewarding uh, input to any grain marketing uh, strategy almost every year since. Uh, but the main thing I want to talk about is never putting all our eggs in one basket. So really often uh, we see this sort of uh, a, a all or nothing approach to grain markets. So we'll have uh, people say, oh, well, I think the market's uh, going to go down. Uh, I'm just going to sell everything. Or, you know, I think prices are, are, are going to go up. My, You know, I'm, I'm starting to turn a bit dry here. Price is going to kick. And they hold back the large majority of their, of their um, crop, hoping that prices will go up. And that to us is an overly risky position to be in. You have, you know, maybe 70, 80 to 100% of your cropping revenue exposed to your hope that prices might go up. And we really want to change that, that overly risky ma uh, sort of mind frame and think more about the risk. So there's things like Selling a little bit, even if you think the price is going to go up, selling 20% of your production and you're right and the prices go up, it's still a good result. We still have 80% of our production exposed uh, to that higher market. We should be pleased with that outcome. But it also means if we get it wrong and prices fall, 
we don't have 100% of our crop exposed to that lower or worse outcome. So we want to think less about, oh, I think price is going to go rise, so I'm just going to do nothing. Or I think price is going to go fall and I'm going to sell heaps uh, and get, you know, and, and oversell. And think more about, uh, you know, in, in sort of uh, percentage wise, I'm going to, I think the price is going to go up. So I'm only going to sell a little bit but versus selling nothing, just in case I'm wrong. Because again, we want to remember that we have no idea, uh, well, not sorry, no idea, but no certainty around where prices are going to go. And anyone who tells you that they know for sure where prices are going to go in the future is selling you something that uh, you should otherwise be not purchasing. So again, we don't, don't want to get into a trap of, of thinking uh, it's all or nothing. We want to be holistic. Be happy if you've sold some, you've taken some risk off the table. Prices kick. Uh, you know, that's still a good outcome. We still have more to sell. Uh, but again, we have a little bit of production if prices fall. So a couple of examples that we've uh, come across quite a lot at market check over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, the disgruntled seller is one. Uh, you know, they might have a, a wheat crop that's two and a half thousand tons and they decide to sell 500 tons of that. So 20 percent of their production, they decide to sell because the price is OK. Uh, they're making money at that price. So they decide to um, to take some risk off the table. And then the market kicks $30 a ton and they get really annoyed. They kick themselves for not waiting and selling at that higher price. Um, and they and they sort of uh, put themselves down for making the decision to sell 500 tons when they should have they should have rated. What's the result of that? Essentially, there is an opportunity cost of $30 a ton times 500 tons. So you could have otherwise made an additional $15,000. So there is an opportunity cost uh, associated to that outcome. But the balance of your crop, so the 2,000 tonnes that you haven't sold, is now worth $30 a tonne more, which is $60,000 to your overall business. And therefore, you're in a much better position than had the market fallen after you sold you might feel better about the sale you made, but your whole crop is worth a lot less money. And again, when you made that 500 ton sale, you didn't know the market was going to kick for sure. So you took a little bit of risk off the table. You still have the very large majority of your crop unsold and it's a good outcome and you shouldn't be disgruntled just because you decided to sell a little portion of that crop before it continued to rally. The perma bull uh, is also a very common uh, grower, um, you know, universally, but but in Australia. And the view is the market's going to rise and they put all their eggs in that basket and sell nothing. This thing's a powder keg. My paddock's going to dry. You know, this thing's just going to kick for sure. And they get it wrong. You know, maybe uh, some uh, a good season is is comes along in Russia. Uh, some areas, the big cropping areas in, in Europe get some rain and there's an abundance of northern hemisphere uh, grain and all of a sudden the market's fallen $30 a tonne. Now that same grower just had two and a half thousand tonnes, they hadn't sold anything and they've lost $30 a tonne on their crop. That's a $75,000 swing or, or loss against what they could have otherwise got for their crop. So again, the main point is that we do not want to be hot, you know, we don't want to be just all or nothing when we're thinking about grain marketing. It always pays uh, to basically balance out what we're doing, have some sold, have a little bit unsold, and so on, so that uh, irrespective of what happens, we get a nice outcome dependent on what the market does every time rather than trying to pick the highs of every season. So a couple of pitfalls is thinking uh, that you will be able to pick where the markets are going. Um, as I said, I've done this for, for long enough now and, and market has been doing it for uh, decades. Um, we've got the client data that shows those who try and pick the, the highs each year um, significantly underperform those who just balance out their program and remain disciplined every year. We need to basically... Um, unburden ourselves with the idea that we should be able to pick 
where the markets are going to go for sure. It's entirely fine to have a view that you might think prices are going to go higher or lower, but we don't want to basically hinge our entire cropping program on that outcome. You know, the very best traders in the world across all markets uh, essentially only get it right about 50 to 55% of the time. Billions is spent by them to basically try and pick the market and they get it wrong nearly half the time. You know, Growers have an enormous to-do list every day, uh, and there's a lot of things that we need to focus on, and thinking that we're going to outperform uh, the market in picking where it's going to go is just not a good use of our, of our time. We should not be timing markets or trying to pick um, highs. Remaining uh, disciplined and being balanced is definitely going to, to make your grain marketing a far less stressful uh, endeavour and your returns will be much better uh, to boot. So your marketing decisions uh, should not be binary. So next time you're thinking about doing something, do not think, oh, I think price is going to go up. I'm just going to wait for a, a few weeks, even though I haven't sold anything. You should be saying, I think price is going to go up. Hopefully I'm right, um, but just in case, price at the moment are pretty good. Um, I might just take a little bit of risk off the table in case I'm wrong. That is uh, the mentality that we want to have when we're thinking about grain marketing. And we want to aim for solid returns consistently. So please take no notice of the guy or girl at the pub telling you they sold at a price that was the highest of the season. I can assure you they sold a lot more um, at a much lower price. We just want to consistently get solid returns. And the only way we can consistently get solid returns is by being balanced and disciplined and managing our risk, not by being or trying to uh, pick the highs in the market or, or, or think that we know something that other people don't know and therefore are going to get um, a better outcome by trying to um, time our decisions around when to sell. Uh, please just keep it disciplined um, and balanced and you outperform, um, you know, 80% of growers who are out there. So what we find is uh, essentially uh, there is a disproportionate amount of time spent worrying about grain markets and where they're going to go and things that are generally completely out of our control. We have no control on where um, grain markets are going, not even as a country. Uh, do we control necessarily where grain markets go? We're part of a global market that influences what our prices do. So we should put far less time in uh, basically uh, trying to figure out where prices are going to go and basically spend a lot more time on things that we can control because that is where we can really extract some actual um, benefit from whatever time we are devoting to our grain marketing each year. So do not think of, don't spend a lot of time trying to analyze where the market's gonna go. Let's focus on things that we can control. You can control your grain price uh, risk management. Set a diary date every month to sit down and review how much grain you have unsold, i.e. how much rain, grain do you have at risk if prices fall lower? Uh, how much should I have sold by this level? I, I, how much am I not allowed to sell by this certain date, irrespective of the price? So get your grain price risk management sorted. You can then decide on how and where you're going to sell it. Uh, maybe you're going to hedge it offshore. Maybe you're going to sell it into town, into the local grain corp or um, cargo site or wherever it may be. Um, who you're going to sell it to. You might sell it into a, into a, into a terminal or a feedlotter. You might sell APW multigrade. You might sell a SFW sale. These are things that we can control, not so much where the price is going to be in two or three months. We can also control who we sell to, our counterparty risk management. Uh, you know, how much risk do we have on to the person that we've sold our grain to? What sort of term and terms and conditions uh, are on each contract? Uh, quality management. Do I have fixed or floating spreads on my, uh, you know, on my Ford APW multi-grade contracts? Uh, is there carry if that buyer doesn't pick up uh, the grain in time? 
Are they paying me on time? All these things are much more in our control. And if you get those five points really humming across your business, I can assure you uh, that your returns will be much better than if you devote the time that you otherwise would have done those five things all to trying to work out uh, where the markets are going. Uh, because, you know, as I said, there is no way for sure of knowing where prices are heading um, between now and whenever you do need to sell to convert that grain uh, into cash. So just on managing counterparty risk, it's a really big part of risk management. Um, we can't ever really eliminate counterparty risk um, without taking on quite a, a decent cost. But there is ways in which we can eliminate the very large majority of counterparty risk as grain producers who are selling into an unregulated market. First of all, we can spread our sales across time. We don't have to sell everything at the same time. We can also spread um, our sales across counterparties. So basically, you don't have to sell it all to one person. Maybe uh, for those in New South Wales, you might have Manildra buying a lot. Someone else is paying the same amount of money. You can spread your sales across instead of having everything uh, exposed to one counterparty. In that example, they're a very, very good counterparty. But too often we see one buyer buys the, the large majority of a, of a grower's uh, grain. And that is just an overly risky position, especially when there might be another buyer there willing to pay just the same, if not very, very similar price for their grain. And, and by spreading the sales out, we eliminate a, a large portion of our counterparty risk. Manage our accounts of receivable. This is a really big one. Um, we've, you know, there's obviously been quite a, a few insolvencies over the time. Um, as a trader, I've been involved in some of them. Um, I.e., I was owed money, not not actually working at the company that went insolvent. Uh, but the one thing that we see time and time again is growers not realizing that they were owed money for a load that they sold into a counterparty two months ago that hasn't been paid. As soon as your contract is up for payment, and again, this goes back to managing your, your, your contract management, knowing when you're owed money, the day after, and it's not in your account, start making phone calls. The squeaky wheel gets the oil in these cases. If you leave it and that counterparty is in strife, they will not pay you. If you call them every few hours or every couple, you know, every day, they will pay you first before they pay someone else. So please be mindful of knowing when you're owed money and being proactive and getting uh, in, in front of that buyer. If you use an advisor like Market Check, we can also put our weight as a business on them to make sure uh, that you're paid um, as soon as, you know, as humanly possible. Uh, you can also negotiate terms. So what am I talking about here? Uh, you can, instead of accepting 30 days end of week, when we think about um, a delivered contract or if you're selling um, uh, X farm, you can negotiate to seven days end of week. It is all negotiable. You will take a small price cut for that, uh, but it is often on the table if you like to uh, lower or, or make the payment terms a bit quicker. You can even do prepayment. We do quite a lot of prepayment at Market Check. Um, if you're not aware of who the counterparty is, uh, don't just hope they're fine. You can pull a few levers to all, all but remove your counterparty uh, risk by getting prepayment. Not all counterparties will do it. There'll be a slight cost because they're giving you money um, earlier than you otherwise would be, which you can then put uh, against your debt or wherever it may be. But that reduces your counterparty risk almost to zero. So you can negotiate uh, these sort of terms. Max exposure. Uh, this is saying, look, I'll sell you, uh, you know, a thousand tons of grain. Uh, I want to make sure that you've paid for the ter first 250 tons before I allow you to pick up the next 250 tons. That means you've been able to sell a, a larger quantity at a price that you're obviously happy at, but you only have incremental counterparty risk with that one buyer. Again, 
negotiate it's very negotiable we do it quite often you just have to know that you're able to ask uh, these sort of questions and um, one of the last ones is credit insurance uh, we offer credit insurance it's a few dollars a ton it is not very expensive and it removes somewhere around 90 percent of your counterparty risk so again credit insurance is an easy way if you don't know who the buyer is or you're not very comfortable you can pay a couple of dollars a ton uh, to basically eliminate your counterparty risk uh, there are products out there and again we uh, we have one of them uh, that can allow you uh, to basically access relatively cheap insurance against any or not any but but most of your grain sales depending on who you're selling it to and the last one is a, a PPSR, uh, Personal Property Security Register. Uh, this is a very cost-effective way of, of enforcing or reinforcing your, your counterparty risk management. Uh, they cost, uh, PPSR costs very little money. You register it per counterparty. So say you work out that you have uh, 10 buyers that you sell 90% of your grain to every year. You do a PPSR. Um, uh, basically against each of those counterparties they last for something like seven years they cost almost nothing to register each of them and they don't take very long either to do and it just means if that company goes under you're much higher up the unsecured creditor list you're, you're just below the bank uh, in terms of getting some result back uh, for that loss of, of payment essentially so you're going to be much better off than than someone without a PPSR who's just sold that grain um, uh, to that buyer and who hasn't been paid. The main thing is though, is just to really change our kind of thinking around counterparty risk. Uh, we say it all the time. If you have a buyer that you know is solid um, and they're bidding $340 for APW or say $900 uh, for chickpeas and there is someone uh, that's paying a few dollars more than that counterparty, but you don't know who this new buyer is paying a few dollars more, is it worth risking the entire 100% for an extra sometimes point something percent uh, improvement in the price? I'd argue it's not. I'm not saying that you should just sell to the biggest counterparties every time, but we need to weigh up the risk reward of just hunting the best price on any given day and thinking, okay, well, who's the next person? Because I'm not confident in who the best bidder is. Okay, it's only a $2 difference. I might sell some to that bigger counterparty uh, just in case the other one doesn't um, pay. So just think about these kind of thought processes when you're making sales. Again, will really save you a lot of the uh, heartache that uh, insolvencies do cause. So just a couple of risk management processes that you can implement very quickly in your businesses, which uh, we'd love to see uh, in, across all grain growing businesses, um, a grain price risk management. How much grain can you have exposed at any one time? Maybe you have a minimum level of sales and hedges at different points in the calendar, i.e. Uh, you never forward sell uh, any more than 20% of your uh, crop estimate uh, before you hit n n October, uh, before harvest, you never walk out of harvest with less than 40% sold going into the following year, or you never go into winter with less than 60% sold. These parameters might sound really basic, but they are very, very handy on uh, basically keeping you disciplined. If you don't have a set um, uh, basic collection of rules, it's very easy to break them. Whereas if you allow, if you put these guardrails in place, it is a lot easier um, when you're looking to make sales to decide on what you should or shouldn't do. Think about how much risk you have in terms of the unsold grain that you have from previous season, if you do have some, plus what you potentially have in the paddock coming at you the next harvest. Look at it holistically, uh, and that will be a better way of determining the amount of risk that you have on. Target prices are good. Um, they're not the, the, the only thing you could use, uh, but incorporating some target prices um, is an effective way of keeping yourself disciplined. If 
prices get to $350 for APW, I will mark at 10%, something like that. Now, if the market doesn't get there, we don't want to be stubborn. So we do need to keep that target moving, but we don't want to get to a point where it get the market might get to 350 and we go, oh, I think it's actually going to keep going up. I want 355 and therefore the market then falls and you, you hit your target price, but you decided you wanted to try and get a couple of dollars more and you lost the opportunity. Once it gets to your target, get it done, move on as part of your risk management process. Uh, if it doesn't look like that your target's going to hit and you're getting too too uh, too far past harvest, then readjust your target prices accordingly. And then have a counterparty risk management policy. Super simple to uh, implement. How much can I have exposed to each of my top five or ten buyers? Who do I not deal with? Have a, a naughty list of people who have not done the right thing by you in the past and do not deal with them. Or if you are going to deal with them, demand a much bigger premium than they're otherwise uh, probably going to bid you. And then have a process for accounts receivable, any late invoices. Have a process. There must be a phone call on day one, an email on day two, a follow-up phone call on day four, uh, and then something more official on day five to really get their attention. Again, if you deal with an advisor like Market Check, we can do a lot of this for you. But having some of these processes outlined, uh, printed out, and cemented within your business will set you on a path that will be a far better outcome over the long run than kind of going with the wind and hoping prices go up and just selling uh, when you need the money and selling it to whoever um, whoever bids you the most, which is unfortunately very commonplace within grain markets um, at the moment. And it's something that we are uh, working very hard to try and uh, dissolve. So moving on uh, to a current market update, um, as I said, I'll start with canola um, and I'll talk about the global canola market. We'll then bring it back domestically uh, and then talk about a few um, strategy considerations. On the chart here, you can see the canola balance sheet. So what am I talking about here? Basically, the canola balance sheet uh, is the global market broken down to uh, ending stocks, which are uh, in the green bars here. So ending stocks, for anyone who doesn't know, is whatever is left going into the next season. So the Australian grain marketing season starts on the 1st of October and goes to the end of September. So our ending stocks are whatever is left in the silos as of the 1st of October uh, from the previous harvest. They are essentially a buffer uh, against any future production issues that might arise. So if we look at the global balance sheet, we look at the global ending stocks, and you add them all together, you get these green bars. It shows how much canola is lying around the world uh, to essentially compensate for any future issues that we might have production-wise. If we look at canola, basically uh, the big big end of town is, is Canada. They're the biggest exporter in the world. We are a distant second in Australia, and then Ukraine is a third. Then if we look at uh, the consumptive or the importing side, we have Europe, who is the biggest importer in the world. They're also a large producer, and also China is a large importer. So if we look at the ending stocks, you can see this in the green bars, shows you how much ending stocks of canola there are in all those countries that I just mentioned. The black line is the stocks to use. So just because you have you know, three or four million tonnes of ending stocks and of canola sitting around the world doesn't really tell us much because we don't know how much we use every year. So we need to incorporate how much we use over the next 12 months to get a sense of if that ending stocks number is a lot or very little. And that is essentially what the stocks to use ratio does. So canola might have a stocks to use ratio of 10%. It means that if we stopped growing canola today, we would have 10% of the next 12 months demand up our sleeves before we'd run out, or 36 days. Now, the higher that stocks to use ratio, the more ending stocks we have relative to the demand we have coming at us, and therefore the price typically sets back. The lower the stocks to use ratio, the less canola we have, and therefore the more bullish the market typically is. 
if you remember to those glory days where uh, canola was trading for about $1,000 a tonne, that was when the stocks to use ratio was at its lowest in a very, very long time. The market was screaming for growers to put more canola in to try and bring supply to market. We responded, produced more canola because of the higher price incentive, and, and the balance sheet has basically loosened up a little bit since. But we still have a relatively tight balance sheet uh, for canola around the world. Uh, geopolitical risks, uh, what am I talking about here? It's, it's, it's Ukraine-Russia um, story. It's uh, the Hamas-Israel to Red Sea uh, and even uh, uh, sort of tariffs and all these different things that we're seeing at the moment. The market is relatively comfortable with geopolitical risks um, at the moment. One thing uh, to take away about geopolitical risks in grain markets is if you see anything flare up, just think one question to yourself, does this particular issue uh, change or impede grain from going from where it's produced to where it's consumed? If the answer is no, and the grain is, is still allowed to trade freely between those two uh, countries, then the market might respond in the, in the short term, but it will not sustain that rally over the long term because grain is allowed to flow freely. We saw it through Ukraine and Russia. If that trade flow is interrupted, it's a different story. So for canola, uh, the current Red Sea conflicts so are the hoodies uh, throwing missiles uh, at different vessels. Uh, that is um, not great for our canola. Uh, it's something that we see is generally neutral or bearish for canola. It's because our canola pre predominantly goes to Europe and has to transit uh, that trade route uh, to get there. And therefore, the increased risk um, of being sunk by a missile has increased the execution costs to get our canola to um, our major import destination being Europe. So that has not been something that has been friendly for canola. The other thing to talk about is the Australian crop in general. Now, <clears throat> this goes across canola, barley, wheat, everything I'm talking about tonight. Um, this is Australia in general. I, I fully appreciate that many people uh, are having a tough season across Australia um, and there are many people who had a very good season on the cards who got frosted out um, a month or so ago. But I suppose in aggregate, um, we do need to recognise that there is not going to be a shortage of canola in Australia this coming harvest and the Australian crop, broadly speaking, looks OK. It's not going to be a bin buster but um, essentially it's not going to be the worst crop we've ever produced either. Uh, I suppose when we talk about canola, we just need to be mindful of um, uh, China and, and Canada. Uh, China and Canada are having a bit of a spat at the moment. China buys 20% of Canadian exports um, and they're basically threatening to implement a tariff. Nothing has been implemented on canola out of, China, out of Canada going to China. So the market is essentially they're trying to shove it out the door of Canada into China before anything is implemented, but nothing has been implemented at the moment. And therefore, the market is very unsure about what it means if China does implement a tariff. For an Australian point of view, Canada uh, could compete against Australia into Europe, which is our largest export home, which would be bad news. Uh, but it does leave the door potentially for some Australian exports to China. So this chart shows Australian uh, canola going to China every season. You can see how sporadic it is. We've done almost nothing in the last three or four years to China. It's because we don't hit their tolerance on black leg. Uh, so we would need to see them, uh, you know, sort of lighten that up a little bit to allow Australian canola go to go to China. If that happens, this whole uh, piece, this whole spat between Canada and China would be relatively friendly for Australian canola. If it doesn't happen uh, and, and we don't pick up that Chinese demand, it just means that we've got increased competition into our traditional export homes. So that would be bad news. But again, nothing has been implemented just yet. Domestically, I've put up here a Port Kembla, so Southern New South Wales canola chart. Uh, it's pretty similar across all of the major um, states uh, on the East Coast and SA. And then we've got uh, the November 24 
European Matif rapeseed contract, so the canola contract over in Europe. You can see how well we correlate to the European price. It's because we send uh, about 65, 70% of our canola to Europe every year. And then the difference between these two uh, prices is our basis. So that shows us how relatively strong or weak our prices are relative to the global market. And you can essentially see in the last few months, especially since that, uh, that, that um, uh, frost that we had, our prices have been going up like the offshore prices have, but our prices have been going up at a much faster clip uh, to recognise the crappy spring that we had, the poor, the really bad frost and the conditions not being very favourable here in Australia. So, uh, you know, there has been a recognition uh, that production estimates have been falling in this, in this country. Uh, we look at our domestic demand. It is increasing. If you look at the major uh, uh, domestic crushing uh, locations around Australia, uh, there's new ones pegged for Brisbane. There, there's a new one pegged in WA, and all the major East Coast ones in New South Wales and Victoria are increasing their um, demand. So that's a really positive thing for canola. Uh, there is pretty limited grower selling uh, at the moment uh, for now. So that is something that's helping our price basically stay up. But we do need to be mindful that the canola is already hitting the bins. We're already seeing new crop canola start. Grower selling has been pretty light so far. So we've got a really undersold grower who is going to use a canola crop to essentially generate cash. It is a cash crop that is generally very heavily marketed in the early stages of harvest. So where there is five buyers and only five sellers in a few weeks' time, there will be five buyers and 50 sellers. So we just need to be mindful that there is growers, limited grower selling at the moment, but that is something that can work against us in the future if we don't take it into consideration when we think about strategy. So <clears throat> strategy considerations, um, I would suggest, and this is general, that, that if you are comfortable to do so, if your crop is well enough advanced that you're happy uh, uh, to forward sell at this point, it's just a matter of uh, when, I would suggest you use the current rally in pricing to get some of those sales on. We expect harvest pressure, especially given that prices uh, are, are at a basically a season high at this point. We're, we're looking at prices um, at around 760 to 770 port equivalent across the East Coast. That is a very strong price, historically speaking. It's a very strong price um, relative to the offshore market. We will see a lot of growers selling in the coming weeks and months, and therefore it generally pays to be a little bit ahead of that and get some sales on now, rather than trying to market a large majority of our crop right when everyone else is trying to do the same thing. Uh, moving on to barley. Uh, so basically the, the current bit of a rut in barley prices here in Australia is not because there is a glut of barley sitting around the world. Actually, if you look at global barley production over two, a two decade span, it really hasn't done a whole lot. At the same time, wheat, uh, wheat uh, soybeans, corn, things like that have all gone up. So the current problem in barley is not because the balance sheet is so loose and there's, there's the supply is going through the, the roof. It is, however, because of a lack of demand and, and most uh, notably out of China. So China takes about uh, 80 percent or has taken about 80 percent of our uh, barley exports in the 23-24 marketing season. You can see here this is global, this is China barley imports from everyone as per the USDA. Uh, they've got them pegged in just over 10 million tonnes. Uh, that is a pretty significant uh, decrease on last year. The question remains on even if they're going to hit that level. So there's real question marks around Chinese barley demand uh, at the moment. When we came into uh, harvest last year, at this point in time, we already had a couple of million tonnes of barley sold to China uh, for harvest and post-harvest shipment. This year, we have very little, if not zero, sold. Uh, and therefore, the market is really concerned about why China isn't picking up the phone, essentially, and where is their demand? You know, it's very likely it'll turn up. 
Uh, but at the moment, they're not returning our calls and the market is seriously concerned. And we're seeing that reflected in our domestic pricing at the moment. We then look at places like Saudi Arabia, which has traditionally been uh, the biggest importer of barley globally, if not the second. Uh, and their barley, whilst marginally improved year on year, uh, is much lower than it was uh, even three to four years ago. Uh, so they're not much of a saviour in this uh, case. And then lastly, the US corn uh, crop, it's coming off uh, right now. It's the largest uh, crop uh, grown on the planet. Um, and corn uh, is is used in, in feed rations, obviously, around the world, as is barley. The more cheap corn around, the more competition barley has uh, into those homes. So a big corn crop is not helping barley pricing in Australia or helping barley prices globally. So domestic barley production, we've got East Coast barley production. Uh, it's basically one of the smaller crops we've had in the last five years. Albeit, if you look over a, a longer period of time, it still is a relatively decent uh, crop. So we do have a decent barley crop coming at us. If we think about places like northern New South Wales, early harvest yields have been exceptional. Uh, and therefore, there is not going to be a shortage of barley across Australia this coming year. There is not going to be uh, a supply problem. We are actually looking more at where the demand is going to come from uh, versus uh, where the supply is. Uh, this is basically where our barley exports went over the last 12 months. You can see why uh, the fact that China is not picking up our phone calls is so concerning. Essentially, what happened uh, is they, they put those tariffs on us um, years ago. We lost China. We all got up in arms. We went off and tried to find all the markets we could to replace them, uh, which we did a quite a good job of. Uh, then China basically dropped the tariffs and we could go back to exporting to China and they paid $1 more than everyone else and we sent the large majority of our barley uh, to China the last 12 months. So this is why the market is so concerned about what's happening in China because they're such a big portion of our exports every year. On the positive side, cattle on feed uh, demand in this country um, has never been higher. Barley is a big player in the cattle feed market, um, and therefore, <clears throat> excuse me, we should see very strong domestic demand um, this year. So that will help at least uh, put a domestic bid under barley um, going forward. So this is the barley market. You can see we had this big rally uh, mid-year, then we saw and in, you know, quite a quite a severe uh, downdraft in barley pricing. You can see all the different port zones from Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, and SA. My point being is the market when we you know we have rallied a little bit off the bottom. The market is reflecting a large portion of what I've just spoken about. It's not like it doesn't know all the things that we uh, just ran through. So you know, barley is not going to go to zero. Um, we have had a little bit of a kick since that um, dry uh, September and the frost, which hurt barley quite a lot. So we have had a little bit of a rally in pricing, which has kind of made us a little bit uncompetitive into the offshore market. Um, but I suppose a lot of what I've talked about is at least uh, the large majority of it is uh, baked into the current barley uh, markets. There is still some downside risk. We have seen barley markets kick 20 to $30 a tonne recently. Uh, there is no guarantee that market is going to uh, keep rallying. And there's not even a guarantee that it's, they're, not gonna, they're not gonna fall once harvest really ramps up. If Chinese demand turns up and it's strong and we start making sales, that will be very supportive of barley markets. If they don't, and we see a bit of growers selling hit the bins, you know, there is certainly some downside risk in our barley pricing. Uh, grower selling is non-existent. There is very little grower selling. Uh, that, again, is helping with this rally that we're seeing at the moment, uh, but can work against us once the grower is forced to the market when they've made very little uh, sales. They're going to have more to market later on. A couple of strategy considerations. 
Uh, you know, it's it's a hard commodity to advise on at the moment, given it's a lot easier when Bali's at four hundred dollars a ton. Uh, just you know, you want to be really aggressive in that scenario, or if they're really really low, you know, you want to hold back uh, more barley and, and hold it into twenty twenty five. This year, it's it's the, it's a little bit uh, both ways. It's a hard market to really get a gauge on at the moment. Um, you know, our advice, our general advice, is to get a small level of sales on if it's the worst thing that you take away uh, from this webinar. It only means the market has kicked and we need to remember our risk management. If the market has kicked, we still have the large majority of our barley exposed to those higher pricing. But if prices are to fall back down to where they were or even lower and this and this rally that we've seen uh, is for nothing, uh, having that sale on will be a real stress reliever for you. And at least we've locked some of our barley in at a more reasonable price than, than than where markets may end up over the coming months. It might be worth bring, uh, seeing what 2025 brings in terms of holding some barley. You know, Chinese demand will inevitably turn up and we don't know what uh, next season looks like. Barley is a wonderful drought hedge. So we will want to keep some barley exposed into next year. Uh, but how much uh, is, is, you know, we need to be mindful of not carrying too much uh, just because the prices aren't where we want them to be. So just to finish up for the evening, um, basically with wheat, uh, if we look at the global balance sheet, uh, we look at the exporter ending stocks, so the major exporters starting with Russia in no particular order, I think Europe, US, uh, Canada, Australia, uh, a couple of others. Uh, if we look at the balance sheet, it's very, very tight. So basically at some point, that stocks to use ratio is going to have to start plateauing and or uh, rising, which can only really be a function of higher prices in the future. But that does not mean that it's going to happen between now and when we need to sell. But over the long run, essentially that black line will need to start uh, going in the, in, in, in the opposite direction. But for the time being, we have a very tight balance sheet in, in wheat. And it just essentially means that the market is really sensitive to any future production issues. If we get a big drought in Europe or, or Russia, the market is going to be very sensitive to the upside should that occur, because we do not have the stocks up our sleeve to absorb a major stocks problem. Now, we got through the Northern Hemisphere uh, uh, sort of harvest back in July, August. It was a pretty decent crop, uh, all things considered. And that is a really key reason why the prices are where they are. Uh, you know, we've, we've come off a little bit uh, because that's, that wasn't a bad um, Northern Hemisphere harvest. But if we do see some issues in 2025 with their crop, you know, our market is going to have a hard time absorbing uh, that issue. So we do need to be mindful of, even though prices are not right where we want them to be, uh, we do have a pretty tight global balance sheet. Uh, China concerns for wheat uh, are the same as barley. We, they're our biggest export partner. Uh, so, you know, again, we don't have any forward sales on or very, very few forward sales on from Australia to China going into this harvest. And it has the whole market really concerned uh, about where this Chinese demand is and when is it going to turn up. We're starting to get through the Northern Hemisphere harvest glut. Uh, things like Russia's export pace has been absolutely firing. Uh, they will need to essentially uh, uh, stop exporting at such quick rate. Uh, they're going to run out of stock if they don't. And therefore, that will really work well for us bringing our crop online over the next couple of months to pick up the demand that would otherwise go to Russia. So we're getting past uh, those really that really aggressive selling period uh, that we typically see in kind of July, August, September, when the Northern Hemisphere farmers are, are hitting the bid at their harvest time. Corn is a headwind for uh, wheat. Obviously, a lot of the wheat uh, that we produce is used for feed, and therefore the more kept corn there is, or the more barley, uh, the more wheat needs to fight for its inclusion in the feed ration. And I suppose it's always worth mentioning there's plenty of risk still in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Um, we've seen a couple of vessels being attacked only in the last couple of weeks. It hasn't really been enough to get the market all that concerned. 
such is the complacency. But we could wake up tomorrow and there's a peace deal, or we could wake up and 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 Ukraine has bombed uh, a major port in Novosibirsk or something, and it's a completely different game. It's unfortunately where we're up to uh, in terms of where the world is at the moment that we just have to deal with these kind of um, geopolitical risks. Um, but yeah, there's, it's it's all for all the more reason to have a risk management uh, strategy in place and not just wing it because. There is plenty of risk to the upside and downside in pricing at the moment. Domestically, uh, the wheat crop has been downgraded in New South Wales quite a lot. There is definitely some scope for further downgrades, depending on how bad the frost has been. Uh, but there will be a decent New South Wales crop coming online, and that does have implications across Australia because New South Wales is such a large producer of wheat. We don't have much carry in, i.e. we're not storing much grain from last harvest going into this harvest, which is good. Uh, New South Wales will likely uh, fill the, the hole that is left by a poorer Victorian and South Australian crop. So there will be quite a lot of grain going across to Victoria from New South Wales and across to South Australia. So if you are selling grain, do not assume the normal home that you would otherwise send your grain to is the best one. There might be people in Victoria and South Australia willing to pay you more than your local uh, buyer. So again, a bit of endorsement of using a broker or an advisor when selling grain. Uh, the supply chain uh, will be pushed in areas. Uh, freight's getting very expensive in New South Wales. That is likely to continue. Vic and SA will have export capacity to burn because their crop has not been very good. But in New South Wales, especially in the central west and northern New South Wales areas, we will see the supply chain being pushed, especially given a very large um, uh, chickpea crop. Spring, as we all know, has been a bit of a bit of a uh, disaster. We're seeing a bit of rain now, but a little bit uh, too late, obviously. Uh, spring rainfall and frost were almost as bad as we've ever seen. Um, basically, what was happening was we were really competitive in wheat into the export market. If we look at where our prices were for APW against Russia as a benchmark, we were very competitive going into September. September was a disaster, uh, so our prices kicked. The good news is the export markets has, have basically kicked up to our pricing. So we are still export competitive, even though we have seen prices uh, kick because of the issues that we're seeing uh, in, in, our, in our production. If we look at our APW pricing, again, very similar for all the other port zones, and we look at it versus Chicago uh, in Aussie dollars a ton, and our basis, it's about neutral. There is some downside in our, in our relative value uh, going into this harvest, especially going into this sort of next few months where there is a lot of supply that comes uh, to the market. New South Wales will need to push big volumes out, um, as I talked about. Uh, so freight is going to get quite expensive, or it already has uh, gotten quite expensive. We will see some strong demand from domestic millers across the East Coast. Um, there is strong uh, domestic milling demand across Australia, uh, but none more so in New South Wales. And we should see a pretty aggressive program from those millers uh, this coming harvest. And lastly, the grower hasn't sold much. I, I would say in the last 10 years, this is the least amount of grower selling we've seen outside of droughts uh, going into harvest. So there is quite a lot of this wheat crop that does need to come to market. So again, it's something that's been helping prices, but will inevitably work against prices at a future point in time when the grower does uh, decide to market um, a portion of their grain. So just to finish up uh, for wheat, if you do have any of your old crop, again, our general advice is to, to get rid of that. Uh, you know, we're getting very close to harvest. Harvest has already begun in Queensland, and northern New South Wales. So, you, you know, if you're in a southern zone, the next week or two, you really want to gonna make a, a, a start or basically get rid of your remaining old crop. Uh, the relative value in Australian grain, so if we keep the offshore market consistent, uh, our prices can fall. Uh, as I talked about, our basis to US futures is a bit high 
there is still some downside in our export pricing. Uh, so we could see our prices weaken here uh, if the offshore market doesn't rally. Uh, so our preference right now is to sell uh, domestically, not hedge offshore. That will change at harvest time. But right now, the risk is that our domestic prices fall and we want to protect against um, that. So our advice is to get some level of sales on. Um, it is, you know, the prices that we're seeing at the moment represent enough value in our view uh, to at least have some portion of your wheat crop committed at current pricing and not be, uh, you know, the very large majority or all unsold going into harvest. If you're not happy with the production risk that that is incurred by uh, selling before it's in the bin, totally fine. Uh, but if you are deciding whether to sell now or, or later, and you've sold nothing, our advice would be to remember that risk management, just get a small amount of sales on in case this market does tumble on us. If you're worried about quality, um, just remember that anything you have unsold is essentially floating. So if you have a, do have a small portion that is uh, 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 sold via an APW multigrad and you have the ability to fix your spreads in, mightn't be the bad shout. Otherwise, there is options of selling uh, X farm or delivered at an SFW base level. You don't get the premiums for, for protein, but the SFW level is much higher than you'd otherwise receive selling an APW multigrade and delivering on uh, on that contract with SFW and taking a big haircut. So that is uh, it for me. I had to get through the content quite quickly. So hopefully uh, you all got something um, out of uh, that. Again, if you'd like to engage market check, if you need a hand with the grain marketing, uh, we have plenty of different options options on how to engage with us that suit all types of growers. So please use the QR code there um, or give us a call on the number below it uh, before this harvest and we can um, uh, sort of set you on the right path. I'll flick it over to you, Ellie, if there's any questions. I run about an hour, so hopefully there's a little bit of time before we have to wrap up. Thanks so much for that. That was great. Um, I haven't got any questions put through at the moment, but I just had a quick one. Um, I just was wondering, is there any sustainable practices that are being adopted in the grain industry and are they affecting any market prices? So the, the biggest one is sustainable canola, IFCC. Uh, Essentially, if you sign up as an ISCC sustainable canola grower, uh, you are eligible to sell at about a $15 premium versus non-sustainable. Uh, to basically get certified, you do do a little questionnaire. We can point you in the right direction at Market Check. You do a questionnaire to essentially it talks through your practices as a grower and, and what land you're putting uh, your canola into and some of the practices you use as a farmer you then basically uh, tick a box you become certified uh, you're then eligible to sell uh, as an ifcc canola producer there is a risk that you get audited which ha does happen to a small percentage of canola growers who do tick that box uh, and if that does happen please give us a call uh, but we are seeing uh, more and more canola going sustainable. It's a, it's a majority now of growers who are doing the ISCC declaration uh, because of that $15 premium. It does exist in Bali, uh, but just not in every location. And the premium is only about $2 a tonne. So we're not seeing, you know, broad, broad scope uh, adoption of it because the premium for you know, sustainable uh, barley is just not big enough to warrant taking uh, taking on the the extra sort of paperwork and, and audit risk. Thanks for that. Um, I just noticed we're a bit over time, so I think I'll just stick with that question. But if anyone has any questions, they can always um, email uh, Nick or or local land services us as well, and we can get back to you. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for tonight. Nick um, and everyone else that has attended and our funding bodies um, that support our program. Um, we have a QR okay. code up at the moment, um, which is for, here we go. Um, yep. This is for a survey um, for us to know if you have any feedback for us um, and any topics that you'd like to see in the future. So if you could please uh, answer that, that would be great. Um, and thanks again, everyone.
Awesome. Thanks, Ellie. Cheers. Good night.